Guten Abend. I know this is supposed to be in English. Um, can I just find out who actually in this room does not speak German? Don't be shy. Okay, five of you. I'm just making sure that you know how we look after our minorities, okay? There's about six, 700 people who speak perfect German, including myself, and I have to speak English just for you. Learn fucking German, okay? <laughs> ah, not you, Paula. Now, I was, I was actually looking for, so, oh, so, so that's why I switch over. Um, that's for you lot. I was actually looking forward, God, there's a horrible echo here. Do I sound like inside, I'm inside a bucket? It certainly feels that way here. Um, I was looking forward for once to speak in German because I do lectures all over the well, not as many as I used to, but it's always English, you know, wherever you are these days. And I thought, Vienna, they speak kind of German there. And I can, <laughs> well, in fact, I mean, in fact, the, the Wiener Burgtheater, at least up to the war, was, you know, the, the, the high point of, of proper German theater language. So, okay, well, that's one thing down. Um, so it's English. I made another mistake. I used to always do my presentation like, you know, on the knees as Paola was speaking or something. And uh, this time I was finished like four or five days ago, which is bad because I haven't got a fucking clue what is in here anymore. I've sorry about the swear. But af after Mr. Bingo, I can swear whatever I like. That's everything I say is, is harmless. So I'm not quite sure what comes next. I have, the, I have a sheet thing here. I have the next slide coming up. And right now my next slide is black, which is very worrying. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, one, one more thing. This book uh, is about me, not by me. So it's not my fault. Uh, and if you go and buy it, I don't get any shares. The, the one issue I have now, I'm, I'm 70, so I'm the oldest person in the room. And if I talk about my work, it would take about two days because I've done such a little, shit lot of stuff. So I can't really talk about my work because then, you know, what do I pick? My favorite projects, all my projects. Um, so I, instead of decide, I've decided to make a sort of educational little Spiekermann's advice corner, the Spiekermann Ratgeber, seven things you might want to um, remember, presuming that most of you here are indeed practicing designers. Um, Paola used the word creatives. I hate using that word because everybody is creative. My mother was creative. Um, so this is what it would have, would have been called if uh, this has been in German. Um, just a little bit about, this is German for forward, by the way. For that. It has a different, some of the sort of social democrat feel about it. Forward doesn't really anymore. The German social democrat newspaper is still called Vorwärts. Not that they know what it means anymore, but um, so I, I have a very checkered career. This, this is me, as you, well, you can't tell because I had hair. Even I was born, I, actually I wasn't born with hair, but then I got some and then uh, as you get older, you know, you go back to your baby state in a way. So. I was, I'm, I'm officially a, a, an architectural historian, which is an art historian that specializes in architecture. But like all the other things in my life, I never finished university. I, I always left when it was, got boring. And that got boring after about four years, got very boring after two years already. Uh, so I decided to be a printer. And uh, I moved to London in, in 77, in, in June. And then I went for a vacation and I came back and my print shop had burned down. Uh, you can see me there with the leftovers. So that was my career as a printer took about four weeks. And, and this is a test. Then I went and uh, w what is a printer without printing? It's a designer, right? Because, you know, anybody you ne in those days, you needed a pencil. So I went and bought myself this machine here, a Stasetograph, which makes headline, you know, you could set headlines. This is photo setting back in 77. Now I'm doing this here as a test because what's wrong with that picture? Look at the type on the top. Are you designers or what? Go home, start over, learn your job. That's Arial, or as I call it, fucking Arial, okay? And that didn't exist in 1977. That's accidents grotesque, okay? Just once for, me, for you, so you take it home and remember. The only thing you learn today is that Ariel totally sucks. It was designed in the late 80s, a copy of Helvetica by Microsoft, and this is accidents grotesque, okay. Do we get it now? That's the real one, okay? That's the one that everybody else copied. Go home tonight and tell your mothers, tonight I learned that Ariel didn't exist in 1977. So then I, I had this machine, so I guess I was a typesetter for a few years, and luckily there was a, a company in Germany called Berthold, which the older ones amongst you may remember. They made pretty cool equipment and very cool typefaces, or even fonts. 
and each one would be 800 marks to buy at the time, which probably like, what, 10,000 shillings or whatever it was at the time. Um, I keep forgetting that I can't pay in shillings here anymore when I come to Austria. It was such a cute little money. And my money was worth a lot when I came here. So I, I made these brochures for, for years and years and years. It was great fun. Uh, it was actually paid. And so I, over time, suddenly had become a graphic designer, which I wasn't aware. I didn't even know what a graphic designer was. I mean, I never studied graphic design. I'm not saying you should do this, but uh, over time, I had become a graphic designer. And when I was in, um, I, was, I was speaking in, in England a couple of weeks back, and one of the people uh, had sort of sent me a brief. I have these questions. I would like you to answer them. <laughs> these are the questions. Um, I said, okay, how many evenings do you want me to speak? So in, if any of you needs to go home, if there's something on TV, I don't know, or, or the lights are on outside, so you have to go home. Die Laternen sind an, müsst ihr nach Hause, ne? These are, this is the quick version. So uh, I'm giving you the questions and the answers. Okay, get it? I'm being very quick. I'm using read English. Um, I get these questions all the time, and I, uh, it's a, it's a to token of how lazy I am. I should have a sort of list that I copy and paste things from, because everybody who wants to interview me asks the same question. What does creativity mean to you? Oh, um, you know, the C word. Uh, boring, boring. And where do you get your ideas from? Boring, boring, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, the only thing that I, and we'll get back to this one, uh, um, that's my, my main motto always has been in life, don't work for assholes. You may notice here that I'm using the English spelling, A-R-S-E. The Americans say asshole, A-double-S, but an ass is actually a female donkey. I don't know where the Yanks get this from, but they're very prudish, so they can't say the real stuff. So what is typomania? Uh, could you ever be cured? Of course not. It's, you know, it's not lethal, but would you want to be? Of course not. And look at this. What does, why does type matter? I mean, what a dumb question. Of course it fucking matters. It's all we read all day long, right? And are the limits what you want to design? Of course there are limits to what I want to design. I wouldn't want to design guns, for example. I mean, it's easy to say, you know, I, we had a studio with a hundred odd people. Nobody's ever walked in and said, I want you to design guns. God knows what you'd say, because you have, you know, people who have families and so I'm not saying I'm, I would have been a hero. Luckily, nobody turned up to wanted us to design tanks or guns or whatever. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Are we at peak design? Of course we're not. We're, there's always new stuff to design. The world is getting ever more complex, so there's lots of things to design. Um, how does your work begin? With a pen or a mouse? Hello. The brain is the most useful thing we all have. I know some use it more than others, but the brain is actually limitless, but it is a little bit my, like my hard drive here. It's all on there, I can never find the shit. And my brain is the same, I know I have it, and I just, retrieval is the issue. And of course, how can I prefer print or digital? We heard from Florian earlier today that analog sort of makes digital possible, or digital makes analog possible, we get to that a little later. So how can I even cho choose, where, where, you know, we live, live in a very much a digital world, so these are all actually pseudo questions. And of course, the most important one is, what advice would I give aspirant designers? Like I said, you know, think. That's the best thing you can ever do and read. It's all been written down by somebody at some point or other. And if you read as many books as I have done or hopefully you have done, there's something in there for all of you. So reading is the best thing anybody could do. Uh, it doesn't mean you imitate what you read, but it certainly enriches you and you realize you're not alone. People have gone through the same issues all over the place. And the best advice I've ever been getting, uh, given is to shut up because I can never shut up. And I, I upset clients and people because I always have to have the last word. It's getting a little better at my age because I think, whatever, you know, I've said it before. By the way, I'm, I'm staying behind here just in case I fall over dead in a minute, which at my age, you know, I don't, if I go here, it might be dangerous. So, so in, in brief, this is what I do. I design, sometimes I say shit, but stuff is actually the nicer word. I design type, obviously. I've designed brands when they were still called, when it was still called corporate design, we didn't call it branding. We've called it many things over, over time, but not right now they're brands, I guess. Obviously publications, uh, information, maybe again, maybe that the, uh, the top of the pyramid is information, as we just heard. Um, communication, information is what we design, or we design communication so people can pick up information. And I've designed companies, I've started quite a few businesses, and none of them has gone bankrupt yet. And I also happen to, uh, I like bicycles. It's one of my passions. Um, I have way more bicycles than anybody needs. My aim is to die with the most bicycles. 
Um, but I know other people have more than I have, so I've got to speed up my... I have bicycles in four different cities. That's my only thing. I have two in, three in San Francisco, two in London, one in Amsterdam, and I don't know, 10 or 11 in Berlin. And altogether, they don't cost as much as the car, which is quite amazing. So that's the bicycle part. Uh, I could go on and talk about this forever because it is the most uh, um, convenient and the most efficient method to go around any, any town in the world, including New York and London. And the difference is made, for example, if anybody's been to New York recently, uh, the difference is made that people suddenly ride bikes is quite amazing. What I don't understand, maybe you can tell me, Paula, why does nobody have lights on their bikes? And is that some sort of dare thing? Is it to be like a weak, wimpish idiot to have lights? I'd, everybody has, it's dark. Are they all suicidal, kamikaze idiots or what? Oh, okay. Okay, so, and so now let's, let's, do, let's get rid of the department of the type design stuff. Um, so of course I've designed uh, a hell of a lot of typefaces. And when I say I have designed, uh, my very early stuff I did on my own. These are alphabetical, not historical. Um, when I you know, used to draw things, but ever since the last, I don't know, 20 years, I've always had people to help design type because A, there's a lot of work and B, it's really boring. I mean, the first five or 10 or maybe 20 characters are fun and then you do 400 for one weight. That is so bloody boring, you wouldn't believe it. So I have people to, you know, do the boring stuff or do the programming, whatever. That's a privilege when you've been doing it for a while. And also, most of the type faces I've designed, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that I did them because they, they were made for companies or brands. Like if you ever take the train in Germany, everything you read there was designed by, by us, um, but it doesn't say my name on it, obviously. That's, that's the whole thing about type design, which I kind of like. And, and stuff that you can actually get for free, like Fira or Fira, um, which you can download on, on, um, on GitHub or on Google. Uh, they paid me, but um, you can all have it for free, which I think is fantastic. There's a, I just found there's a typeface downstairs, info screen, that one over there. Well, that was done for the Viennese company that has the screens inside the buses and trams here. I forgot about that. That was done, I don't know, five, six years ago, or maybe 10 years ago, I can't remember. Um, so if you ever read those screens in the, we did those. I, I totally forgot about that. And of course, um, some of them are sold. I know some of you, there may be one or two people in this room who actually pay for a license. I know most of you don't. I don't want to know. But uh, for a while, I made it quite a decent living out of the licenses fees I got for Meta. Um, but again, most of the stuff I've done is, um, has been done for corporations. But look at something like Officina, which I did in 89 and 90. It still sells. I still get a check every quarter. You know, sometimes it's a thousand dollars, sometimes it's three thousand dollars. That's the coolest thing about anything that is, has an IP attached to it. Whether you write a book or design a typeface, the money keeps coming in, which is fantastic. It's not big money, but it's kind of like, you know, really nice. I advise you to do that. No guarantee that it would ever be successful. If you watch the news in Germany, um, ZDF, the second, you know, that's my typeface there in the news and stuff. So now you know. Okay, that was, that's that department gone. I, there's one warning here, though. Um, that is the very first check I got for my IDC Officina in 1991, one dollar and nine cents. So while it's still paying, but if you want to become a millionaire very quickly, I would not choose type design. Uh, apart from the fact that at the time there was hardly any competition. Now there's probably a hundred type designers in the room here. Uh, I, I already have met a few of them. They still work, but you know, don't think that you're going to be rich tomorrow. And talking about becoming rich, uh, I've made a few mistakes because like most of you, I will never read contracts. I still don't. So I, I wrote and designed these books for Adobe way back. The first one was in 93, then the second issue came out in 2003, and the third one, uh, I don't know, three or four years ago, and then there was a German version, and then there was a um, Thai version, and uh, now a Korean one. Now, I don't get a penny for any of these. And when I got my first check for the book, I signed a contract with Adobe Press, and I thought, this is really cool. Uh, the book's going to sell for $20. They printed 180000 over the last, whatever, 20 years. And I never got any money, so I went back and looked at my contract. It turns out that Adobe has a contract with the publishers, Peach Pit. So Adobe get 10%, and I get 10% of 10%. I thought I was getting 10%, so I get 1%. So, because I didn't read the contract. If I read, I could have said, oh, wait a minute, guys, you know, I want the full lot. But, you know, being a typical designer, ah, whatever, life's too short, I advise you to, don't read them, I'm, I get dizzy if I read contracts, but get somebody else, pay somebody to read the contract and negotiate in, in, on your behalf. 
I'm not saying I could have been a millionaire, but you know, if they sell 180,000 books and I would have got $2 each, you know what that means, right? 360,000 fucking dollars I didn't get. So read your contracts. My favorite book though that I didn't write, but I read was the, the, the famous or infamous, some of you may remember them, the, the font book, which is the catalog of font shop we started. I think the first one came out in, in 90 or 91. The last one, this one here, uh, maybe in 2008, I can't remember, uh, was six in 1,700 pages. And I was the one who did the proofreading. Now, if you proofread 1,700 pages of A to Z, it's not very funny. And I actually blame my first divorce on, on spending all, all my time in, in, the, in bed reading um, the font book instead of doing what other people do in bed, like sleeping, for example. Um, but it's a great book. If now they're being sold on, on eBay uh, for you know, loads of money because they're rare. And it's actually quite nice to go back and look at, a, look at fonts that are actually printed. Um, so now we come to what I said earlier. So I have seven propositions to make, and I'm using the, um, the numbers in between to show off my, my latest typeface, which is uh, FF Real. Like, I would never ever be able to use an extra lightweight. I mean, I know you all do. There's all these websites that have a light gray type in extra light in 16 pixels on a white background, which is really, really dumb. But that's what young designers do because they have good eyes and they look at 400%. But us consumers don't look at 400%. We look on a phone and this is a cardinal sin, but here I can do it. So I'm, as you will notice there, are you, I'm using all seven weights of real. So that's my main motto. As I mentioned earlier, this is the American spelling. Um, I know it seems an easy kind of advice, but let me show you how, how we go about it. Um, I'm, I'm showing some work from the uh, Eden Spiekermann, which is my company that I'm officially retired from. So um, some of the projects I show you were done there in, in Berlin. Now we've had this, I wrote this manifest for us, uh, I don't know, maybe in the, in the early 2000 when I got out of meta design and started over. So I wrote this manifest, seven points for the, our clients to know who they're dealing with. So if people read this and they still want to work with us, fine. Uh, and the first one is, it's very important, also I have to make this distinction um, between customers and clients. Because in German, I heard it a few times today, people say Kunde, I don't have a Kunde, I don't have a customer, I have a client. My clients have customers. So my Auftraggebers, as we are in German, have Kunden. Okay, get this right, because we ultimately work for their customer. We've got to tell them, wait a minute, you know, your customers won't be able to read this because we are also the consumers. So this prepares the, my clients and I might actually you know, contradict them because I said, this is crap. I mean, I remember we were approached by a um, Korean company and they were going to sell diet water. Water, you know, the stuff that comes out the ground, diet, I mean, how can you, what's in water? How many fucking vitamins are in water? Diet water, we said, I don't think that's a project that suits us kind of because it's going to be embarrassing. I think somebody else is making the, the packaging for diet water. Whatever next. I know this is all easily said, but you know, if your clients read this and they know they have to deal with you there, um, it's, it's important because they have to be, you know, we want, we want our clients to really challenge us, to really give us hard projects, because easy projects are kind of boring and anybody can do them. And if we get too happy with, with the stuff we do, then the work becomes Medi mediocre over time, as it does anyway. I mean, if you, if you work in a fairly successful company and you're doing well, uh, you know, then you, over time you keep hiring people who are nice and say yes to you and you keep hiring lower and lower and lower. And after s 10 years, you just have a lot of yes sayers in your company and the work becomes boring. It might be successful, but it's boring. And I think life shouldn't be about boring. And that's another thing, you know, people often come up with, you know, want you to have, they have a list of uh, priorities and you've got to answer them. No, we actually answer, we don't give answers, we ask questions first. It all seems obvious, but you're surprised. And then the other thing is, you know, people, um, especially the public clients, I haven't worked for many uh, recently, they treat you like a, like a supplier. That's what we call in German a Lieferant. And you even get a supplier's uh, contract, so you have to deliver 25 pieces of design, you know, two by three meters or whatever. Um, I remember the, uh, the brief here for the Vienna airport, I don't know when that was, like 10 years ago. Um, they wrote to me and they wanted us to deliver, I don't know, about 400 signs, designed and ready-made. I said, that, that's not what we do, we don't deliver stuff, we're not suppliers. We need to work with you and, and ask questions. Um, well, of course, th that seems obvious, you know, talk to us, we need 
feedback. You be on these days, work in Agile, uh, I mean, most of you probably work Agile, I hope you do, uh, involves the client every week or every other week. In the old days, or still some companies, you do something, you sit at home, and after six weeks, you go to the client, give them whatever you've done, and that's it. But there's no feedback in between. You might be totally barking up the wrong tree, as the Brits say, um, but you have no feedback in between. So I'd much rather talk to a client like, every other day, and that's what I mean about partnering. You'd be surprised how clients would actually appreciate that. But the most important thing is that, and it's not being arrogant, it's actually being practical. You know, we do stuff that our clients can't do, that's why they pay us money, that's why they hire us. So there's a certain limit when I say to the client, you know, shut the fuck up. I might not say it in that many words. I said, could you please shut the fuck up? Because, you know, we know what we're doing. And, the, you know, they can't come in and says, oh, uh, we've, uh, my, my, whatever, my brother's uh, son is a programmer, he's a coder, and he wants to do Typo 3. I said, no, we've already started doing this, you know, uh, open source or whatever, we don't want a Typo 3. And, you know, this sort of stuff, they're clients, they don't know this shit. And what's even more important, and I know it's a touch, it, I hate talking about money to clients, because it's kind of like, I'm not saying it's embarrassing, but, you know, we do cool work, and uh, we should get paid for it because we are supposed to make our clients more successful, richer, whatever you want to call it. So even if I'm embarrassed to write proposals and I always think, oh my God, this is too much. You know, is this a piece of, piece of cake? We can do it in two days. No, we never do it in two days. Always takes 20 days. So I get other people to write the proposals because I will always underestimate work. Um, but you have to take clients, okay, you know. This is what it costs. And more important, for the last few years, we have only worked for clients who have a budget. If a client calls and says, uh, I would like you to give us a number for this and this job, and they might give you a long briefing, say, why should I do this? I know you have a budget. Uh, so if you have 50,000, you get 50,000 worth. If you have 20,000, we'll think about it. If you have 200,000, fine, we'll make you a big project. Um, but if they say, oh, we don't have a budget, then they're not clients. I'm not going into a restaurant without money in my pocket. Say, oh, can I eat here? I might pay eventually. No fucking way. So if clients don't have a budget, they're not clients. It's very simple. So one more thing, and that's the most important one, no free fucking pitches. It seems obvious, but I, I'm always surprised. Well, no, it's easy. Everybody says, oh, of course not. And then I hear everybody, oh, well, you know what? This is so interesting and, you know, and these are nice people. And blah, blah, blah. So everybody does them. They, don't, they might do them back at Aiden Spiegelman behind my back, but not when I'm around. Because you know what? It does not work. If a client ask and is asked for free work, he's, again, not a client. Because clients must appreciate that our most important resource is this one between our ears. And if we give this away for free, what else do we have left? Do we deliver the artwork or the code at the end of the day? No, this is what we deliver. Our ideas, our involvement, uh, our courage, whatever you want to call it, our creativity, for God's sake. And so free pitches are just total rubbish. It's the same guys who don't have budgets. They ask for free pitches. Oh, we don't need much. Just send us some sketches. No, we don't send you fucking sketches. We, we come out, to, we talk to you, we look at your project, we write your rebrief, which is already two or three days of work, and then we decide whether we want to work with you, okay? No free pitches. And you know what? I've been doing this for now since 2002, 15 years, and the good thing is it filters the potential clients. Clients read the... Um, the uh, manifesto on the website, the, they have our little uh, um, little manifesto uh, about the f not free pitching, so it sorts out some of them. The ones that want a free pitch don't even call anymore, because or some call up and say, uh, I understand you don't do free pitches. I said, absolutely right, so what do you want? Well, not a free pitch, good, then you can be a client. So there, I'm telling you, do it. Now, um, the second most important thing, other than not working for us, is of course not working with assholes, meaning if you're an employer, or I'm sure most of you work in a little sort of relationship with a couple of people, maybe five or six people, as you all know, sometimes the first one out of college goes wrong because you think you're best buddies until you get into money and, you know, all the jealousy happens. But the worst mistake you can make is hiring people who come in, have a great portfolio, and are really well behaved, keep their hands on the table and answer all the right questions. You think, eh, I don't know, do you want to share like 10 hours a day with this guy? Do you want to have a beer in the evening with him or her? Um, and I've had people show my work in their portfolios because these days it's all copy and paste from somewhere, you know. It's, it's all online somewhere. And, and if I see people showing my work, and I think, wait a minute, you maybe should do your homework again. So I, um, 
I'm very proud that when uh, I Magazine came to Berlin, this is like 10 years ago, they went round, round town and uh, interviewing, this is a, a, an article about the Berlin design scene, interviewing um, designers there and then John Waters came back after, after a week and said, you know what, I can't find anybody who hasn't worked with you, which is, you know, good and bad. It always hurts when, when people leave, but we just had a, a half a dozen people leave because they've been there for two years. They come out of college. If they stay in the same company, the first company for more than two or three years, they're lame. They need to move on. It hurts me because they're like children, my, you know, my, my sons and daughters. But um, you build a network over time and a lot of them have come back as clients. I've had clients who were my students 25 years ago, who were my employees 25 years ago. So look after your networks. You might think they're all competition. And by the way, I appreciate that. That's one thing I, I see in some of the, the, the cities in the US, that the designers hang out together much more than they do, at least in Germany. I don't know about Austria. Uh, I don't know about Vienna. But here we tend to be, you know, well, no, he's competition and he could get my work and maybe, you know. You do, we don't have tricks that people don't know. It's all public knowledge anyway. And um, nobody's going to steal your clients away from you. And if they do, they will be reborn as cockroaches. So who cares? So build a network, it's very important, and don't treat anybody badly because they'll treat you badly when the time comes. So um, one of my famous or infamous sayings is, yes, you know, we're all about la-di-da, we do this and we write manifests and we write books and ultimately we do work. And the work that's out there is how we get judged. This, for example, was, some of you may recognize this, it's all over the, the streets, uh, roads in Austria. I was asked to design these bitmaps down there for the um, European uh, road network, as it says there. So I did bitmaps in different sizes for those LED signs. And then the client comes and says, oh, you know what? Could we now do an outline font? And I should have said no, because this is not how we work. This outline font will be ugly because it has to fit the bitmaps. But I thought, oh, you know, they asked nicely and they, well, they actually, they didn't pay very much for it. Okay, whatever. So I designed an outline font. Um, and then they said, well, this is all very nice and it's quite legible. And we had a university in Budapest test it on people in dark rooms and stuff. And, but could we have a, a condensed version because the, the, the names in Austria and in Germany for that matter are long. Um, so I, I said, you know what, we don't read narrow typefaces very well. But I still made one for them because they asked nicely. And I thought, I don't want to be a spoiled so I don't want to be an arrogant designer. Now, all over Austria, they use the wrong typeface. They use a condensed one, which is actually not very legible, I hate to say. So when you drive along at speed, um, you know, the things condense, compress even more. So I am now to blame for kind of illegible signs in Austria because I didn't say no in time or I didn't insist that they shouldn't use this. You know, but how can I insist that the Austrian ministry or whatever, it's Verkehrsministerium or whatever, don't use that typeface. I mean, that's nothing I do. But if people see this and say, oh, this no, luckily nobody knows except you know, so you keep quiet. Um, the normal car driver with all the Spiekermann asked off from Berlin, look what the shit he designed. So sometimes it's good not to be known in, in, in there. Uh, you notice how the weight goes up? And now, uh, I have to maybe mince my word. God is not, I mean, I don't believe in God very much. Um, I, I couldn't think of another saying. Who can we put there instead of God? You know, some higher power or whatever. Somebody's in the details. It's, it's all in the details. So while I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to you to, to, do, to look at the big picture, at the same time we get judged again by the results and if the results aren't right. So we did this, this great branding for Deutsche Bahn way back in 2005. We did all the typefaces for them. You take a train and you certainly know you know, where the restaurant is, which is probably the most important decision you make or journey, go straight for the restaurant car. The food is actually quite good. So that's sort of the big branding. So we know in Germany the long distance trains are white with a red stripe, the short distance trains are red with a white stripe. Duh, it's easy. Once you've know, you know that, it's, it's obvious. Um, and then they came back to us recently and said, well, you know, the details aren't quite right. There's a lot of old stuff there. Did I just skip one? No, I didn't skip one. So we want people on the new trains, we want people to know uh, where they should enter. We don't want everybody to enter there and then wa walk all over the train. It takes us 10 minutes to board people, but we don't have the time. We have three minutes only. So we need to know where the first class is, where the, where the non-smokers, actually they're all non-smokers, where the handicapped uh, are and all the rest of it. And I had always, I don't know why, I've always had this dislike of boxes uh, around, you know, you remember the old forms from the, 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 the uh, finance, finance ministerium and stuff. They always have boxes around, frames. For some reason, public servants 
uh, engineers think that the type would fall off the page if you don't have a frame around it. And I've been telling them for 50 years, I've never seen type fall off any fucking page ever. But no, 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 we've got to, otherwise people don't know where the page ends. As it's cut off. It's A4 for, anyway, so this is the one thing I said, a chance to get rid of a frame, which to me is my biggest achievement ever. I got rid of the frames around the little uh, indicators by the doors of the German trains. I think I deserve a Nobel Prize for that. I certainly do a Mahoma, thank you. <laughs> and this takes two years, because this is something that this to them is like a, re oh my God. You know, I mean, this is like abolishing gravity. What's going to happen? Where will those letters disappear? Spiekermann's taken off frames away. You know, terrible. Anyway, so the other discussion is, of course, they said, okay, we want people to know where first class is. I said, well, fine, we do a little yellow marker because they don't use yellow very much. Um, and first class, they said, yeah, but then where second class? I said, second class is where there is no yellow marker. No, no, then we could have green for the second class. I said, no, you don't need green for the second class because the second class is where first class is not. <laughs> two, two years discussion that you don't need a second hierarchy when there's only two in the first bloody place. Oh, I don't know how I, how I lived through this without having a heart attack. I've learned that. I mean, I've learned to just send other people, say, okay, I can't go this week because I'm going ah. um, So they, we finally got this. I mean, I, I won't go into too many details. We, you know, we, we try to get rid of the word peace, psst, here, which means quiet. Okay, they got it in there. I got my frames, I got my yellow, I got my logos there. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very happy camper. And then just recently, so this, this train is out now, and then for the uh, inauguration, this new train, the new signage, they did this great video, and I want you to listen to this amazing corporate sound here. This is the future, by the way, arriving slowly, approaching. has arrived. We're driving into it, into the sunset, somewhere at the bottom of Hauptbahnhof in Berlin. I think they looked, they watched too many car commercials, those people. <laughs> I find it a little, uh, I mean, kind of sweet in its naive way, but this is how some guy at the Deutsche Bahn in, um, in some tower thinks that, the f that, what, that what the future would sound like. Um, I've noticed here time left is zero seconds. You didn't set the clock, did you? But it says zero seconds. But I'm supposed to speak for 45 minutes. <laughs> I'm at 37, by the way, so I've got to hurry up, okay. Now, this is the other thing that for some of us, some of us it's very difficult to digest that oh, the best work we do is actually invisible. I'm not saying it's, in, it's, invisible, it's white on white, but people don't know we've done it. And I'm, I'm proudest of the work that I've done that people don't know. So you design a typeface for the Deutsche Bahn and they print all the stuff with it. And, um, you know, nobody knows this is, they kind of feel this is the brand. Um, this is their typeface. But nobody's really interested. Nobody cares what typeface they use as long as they arrive on time and that I design those beautiful timetables. Uh, nobody gives a fuck, which is good. I'm the only person who sits there drinking out of the cup that has all my type on it. And I get a hell of a pleasure out of it. This is so fucking cool. Look, it's all my type. It's all, and you don't know this. And I'm not going to tell you either. I think it's really cool. It may be stupid. Or designing timetable for Berlin Transit way back in 1990. You know, 
timetables are not very, you don't get a Nobel Prize in design for that, but I get immense pressure, pleasure out of designing something that is good looking and, and legible, or in fact, as we did in Berlin, when the cities were reunited, the signage for a whole new city, which is, I mean, how, how good a job is that? You do this once in your lifetime, you get paid for it to, sh to create order uh, and, and a pleasant environment in your own city. Pretty cool. Or something like this here. I mean, people don't know. I designed The Economist way back in 2001. The Economist newspaper in England. They call it newspaper. It's a weekly. And nobody knows. That there was never any credit, which I think is cool. And now we're redesigning it. Um, but the brief for the redesign is to redesign it so subtly that nobody will notice. It's just like, you know, w wiping the table and cleaning up the pillows on the bed and stuff. But people aren't supposed to notice. So the design is invisible. It's all about the content for once, which I think is great. So I won't have a credit in there. So you're the only, the only people who know, and some others maybe, that I actually de re I'm redesigning the economies and the websites. And this is another thing. Whatever you do, like I already did with the Austrian signage, you send it out there and somebody may use it against you. You design a typeface and... Um, like this one we did for, uh, for Mozilla at the time. Now it's, uh, it's open source, it's on GitHub, and people do their own versions. And it still has that name on it, so people blame me for it, tough shit. This is what happens, I got paid for it, it's public. Um, the one little story I have to tell for those of you who, who do speak English, the, 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 the browser is called Firefox, so they have these, all these fire names there. So they were gonna call this Feura, which is the Portuguese for fire, F E U R A, which the English pronounce Führer. And I said a typeface design in Berlin called Führer. I don't think that's a very good idea. Oh, we didn't think of that. <laughs> They're in Portland, Oregon, so we renamed it Feira or Führer. F give me a break. But that's you know some of our American friends are like a little you know narrow-minded there. They don't even have passports. So this can happen. You know, somebody designs this horrible interface with my lovely typeface. Tough shit. Um, or this particular one. I did all the bitmaps for Nokia way back in, uh, I think, 2000. And, you know, all the, all the fonts, all, the, all the, the bitmap typefaces. And then, again, they came, like the, um, the Austrian authorities said, oh, can you make a, a typeface from the bitmaps? I said, oh, fair enough. So we made this great typeface, the one on the top and to the two at the bottom. And then in 2004, they made it their, their brand. And, then, re and then, then a few years later, I think 2010 or 11, Nokia kind of almost disappeared and they had some other typeface. And I thought, this is cool, I could maybe use that again because it's actually a cool typeface, they don't use it anymore. And just as I was about to look at the files and see what I could appropriate for myself, they come out with this, uh, this new 3310, the old faithful New Yorker typeface. So my old typeface is back on there. Um, and I have no control over it. I, I, ha you know, I have no say in what they do with it, so I have to live with the fact that sometimes those skeletons come up from the closet and hit you in the face. I, mean, I don't think it's too bad, but it can happen if you, if you do work. You have to let it go. Okay, almost done. And one thing I've always liked, and this is a very ch short chapter, is constraints. You know, what do they call in German? Einschränkung, Begrenzung, whatever. Um, I, if somebody tells me, or oh, do whatever you like, you know, like blue sky, that scares the shit out of me. Because if I did that, I would be an artist. I would invent my own word. No, I, I want to work for you and solve your problems. I did these um, house numbers for Design Within Reach, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. And they were all made from different metals and different methods. And the, the top one there, the five, that was made from aluminium. And it's extruded, so you, you have a pretty, um, pretty rough process. And you can't influence what the machine does to it. So the inside corners um, would have been some sort of roundness or other. So instead of giving them my ordinary typeface, it would have been sharp, and then the machine making something from it, I designed the, the, the round corners into it. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but this is the only way you can control chaos, is by, by actually doing it for the constraints rather than thinking, I want my perfect letters. They will never be perfect. Another example where uh, constraints are good, this is a, uh, we, we print these posters back in the, in the, in the, uh, in the press shop in Berlin, and um, I, start, I start setting something, and then I realize, oh shit, I was gonna do this better done than perfect, I only have four E's. Okay, so, who needs five E's? So this is not clever, this is, this is because we only had four E's. I would have preferred to have a t the second E in perfect, and now everybody thinks it's really clever, no it's not, there was only four E's. And this happens all the time when you have big type, you know.
So my last point, even though I have two minutes, two minutes left only, I go ahead through it. We heard this already from uh, uh, Florian, who does the SuperSense shop here in, in, um, in Vienna, that maybe the digital enables them the uh, analog more than ever. Um, so I've officially been retired from Eden Spiekermann for three, I still work on some project, but I've been out of there for three years officially. And I opened this uh, uh, press uh, print shop across the street in this beautiful um, building in the, in the backyard. And uh, we've been collecting, I think I have more presses now than bicycles. The trouble with presses, they weigh like two tons a piece and they take a shit of room and they are very happy to carry. Um, I will die with the, the man with the most proof presses on, uh, um, in my possession, but that's going to be probably on the tombstone. Uh, Spiekermann hat die meisten Corexes in der Welt. So that's the little shop we have. As you can see, it's pretty clean because we don't work enough there. And uh, we've been collecting and now we've actually started producing stuff. It's great fun. It's great fun to get your fingers dirty. I have dirty fingernails every, every day. Um, we have these in another location, these big, big presses that we've been restoring for three years. So we can print posters uh, to that size. And for my American friends, that poster on the left is 905 by 1280 millimeters. I got, uh, when this was first published, I got emails from America. How big is that poster? Okay. Well, you know, they would know because I don't know what a millimeter is. They probably think it's inches or something. That's my assistant, Ferdinand, who is taller than me and just one little project to show you how idiotic is what I'm doing. So a friend wanted to use 60 point, 60 point, accidents test for a project. So I said, okay, we can get the mattresses from a museum in Leipzig and we can cast it on, in, a, in a foundry. But of course at the time they didn't, this is 1898, they didn't have the ads, the, the ads sign, they didn't have arrows and they certainly didn't have hashtags and shit. So we found somebody, oh, and I got this letter back from the type founder saying, okay, uh, I, there's no, mat no mattress for the S, and no mattress for the M. Um, so we found somebody who can actually make mattresses, you know, the brass negatives as you were, with a CNC machine for like 20 euros. So I had about a dozen of those made, and we cast letters that didn't exist before. The trouble is, the whole thing comes so, these three drawers that you saw, the three cases, 3,300 euros. So. Uh, this is a very expensive hobby, so I would advise you not to try this at home. It's totally ridiculous. I have no idea why I'm doing this. The type is so beautiful, I'm not ever going to use it because it's going to get destroyed. So it's going to sit there in this case. It's like stupid. But we also make our own coffee. And that was, I have to tell this only because that, um, you know, they said, oh my God, what are we going to name this? You know, should we have like, you know, get the post-its out and do a naming session? I said, well, we're, we're a letterpress shop and it's espresso. It's fucking letterpress, all right? I mean, duh. That naming session took one minute. And um, that's what it is now. So you don't always need to get the design thinking out. So the last thing, that the book that I, um, I, I showed at the beginning that Johannes Erler wrote about my work, um, I said to him, I'm not going to get involved in, in, in designing it because two people can't design a book. It's certainly not the, 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 um, the subject of the book that would be horror. You design it, but I will design a typeface just for the book. Because I've, I've, I've always wanted to design this new version of Accidentsko test, my own. I'll do it for you. So I did that. Uh, and then, of course, later uh, we made it into a complete family, as always, but it wasn't even supposed to go on sale. And when it was done, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have this in large poster type? So I found somebody in Romania, of all places, that cuts these wooden letters on a CNC machine. So I sent him this data, you know, with all the, um, the measurements that you can probably not read from the distance there. And a few weeks later, you know, this truckload of type arrives doesn't arrive. It arrives. It's going to arrive on your screen any minute. It's probably just outside of Bucharest and... Uh, no, no, no. Oh, there it is. It's not here for some reason. Strange. Did you switch me off there? No. Whatever. Anyway, I mean, it's, I don't know if any of you appreciate this, but a table full of large wooden type is like a boy in a, in a, in a, in a uh, toy shop. It's fantastic. It's totally stupid and rubbish. And, and we've been researching how to make new, le new wooden letters where you will never have enough so in the, in the 40s and 50s, they did this already in, in, in Germany with a, with a resin. So we've been cutting plexiglass, we've been cutting um, what you Americans call formica, the Germans call resopal. Uh, we've been 3D printing, we've been extruding, we've been using all sorts of materials in different woods and stuff um, to recreate wooden type. I mean, this is the dumbest thing ever. I mean, who wants wooden type? You never have enough, you only have one size, and it wears very quickly. Still. There seems to be a sort of um, 
something going on that we need this hands-on, as we heard uh, at SuperSense this afternoon, people want to just, you know, do the real thing, as this uh, guy in The Economist wrote a few years ago. Um, you know, everybody has, makes new print products, which is quite amazing, even though ob officially everything is on the internet. But somehow, once it's on the internet, you want to have it, hold it in your little hands, and there is a, an amazing wave of new magazines that come out every, certainly in Berlin, I don't know about here, every week a new magazine is launched. Some of them only last a couple of issues, but we obviously have some sort of uh, inbuilt passion to print, to make ourselves heard and felt at the same time. So this, the, the hipster version of letterpress is this one, you know, where you press things really deeply, which I was uh, not allowed to do uh, when I was an apprentice. And then we got the, the really expensive, the bibliophilic people. This is a, a, a reprint of one of the Shakespeare plays. It costs $600 to buy. It's all monotype typesetting. It's all, uh, I think the leather is elephant foreskin leather or something. Elephant and forehead leather or whatever it is. Um, it's very scary, very expensive. I bought one just to look at it. And then you look at this type. Give me a break. That's horrible. Look at that. The baseline bounces, the width are over. They call this nice type. This is crap. It might be monotype. It may be holy, but it's scheiße. Um, so if I want to do this with Adobe um, Kazon instead, I can make it so that it would look properly once printed on, on my, one of my letterpress machines. So we print books now. We're in the middle of printing um, Louis Rosetta, the, the founder of Wired magazine in the 90s. His memoirs are printed letterpress which I find quite ironic and quite nice. So we have these big ass machines. I know, I'm, I'm over by four minutes, bear with me, I'm almost done. So we print in books and this is exactly what happens where the digital meets the analog because I'm not gonna sit down on a monotype machine and reset all this copy, it's too expensive. I get a Word document, I do my book design as I always done, we make a polymer plate Nylon print in German, which is metal back, put it in the machine and print it. So we get letterpress, we get the impression, we get the thick black ink, but we don't get the disadvantage. We don't have to schlep around uh, 55 forms. It takes four people to lift up. So the digital meets the analog and we get great satisfaction out of it. And I guess those are the final words. I've been trying to uh, translate this. It, it's very difficult to translate into, into German even. It's, it's weird. What it's basically saying is that the, the little indentation that you have at the corner of it, if you look at this image here, if you look at the one on the left, there's a little white glow. And we don't see this, but we feel it. That's like we heard earlier from LPs. Um, LPs are crap, really. I mean, they wear off and they they're crackle and they have dust on them. But there is something in there, some natural sound, because there has not been, no digital signal has been, been cut away. The same is here. There is a sort of little noise on the side, which is almost like wool as, a pair, as, as compared to nylon. And somehow we like this. Somehow our eyes like the softness, even though it's precise and sharp, but it's still has an inherent material that I think appeals to, the, to human nature because we are very analog and some more than others, but I am certainly totally analog and I will die a happy analog person. So we'll finish with my, my motto in German. I'll give you a translation. We all know this, right? It's all done. Well, it's not all done. It's all ready. We just have to fucking do it. Isn't that boring? If we could just finish when, when it's done in our head. So uh, I'm sorry I'm six minutes late. But um, that's it for the evening.